This is joint work with Ragesh Jaiswal, um, Bruce Capron, Valentin Cabinet, Valerie King, and Stefano Tassaro. Um, so uh, I'm going to start off with a, a story that's pretty interesting. Um, this is historically true, or at least not verifiably false. <laughs> um, so, uh, so take you back to World War II, and if you um, weren't there in person, um, you might recall that that German U-boats were a big threat to the Allied Navy. Um, they would come up and sneak around and blow ships out of the water. So, um, but uh, there were, um, the, you know, they weren't the top of the food chain. The Allies had pretty devastating torpedoes that could possibly sink a U-boat. Okay. And, you know, being underwater, they were kind of fragile if you built, burst a big hole in their side. So, um, but getting the torpedo to the submarine is a problem. Um, because, um, you know, the submarine is down there somewhere in the water, you, you're, you're only like using sonar to sort of vaguely detect where the submarine is, and that torpedo is down there um, trying to find where the submarine is. That torpedo was shot from that ship? Yeah, <laughs> it, it made a big detour. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so, um, so the ship has to, okay. The, the original torpedoes, I think even beginning in, in, at the beginning of World War II, they were actually like manned vessels. Somebody actually got down in the torpedo um, and then only launched it when the submarine was in sight. So, but, um, but I think by the sort of middle of the war, I hope, they had, or at least were planning to have, radio controlled torpedoes. Um, where the torpedo would get instructions from the ship and they'd be sending signals back and forth between the torpedo and the ship and the, you know, the ship had, the torpedo had sonar and the ship had sonar and they tried to piece together where the submarine is and the person on the ship would be navigating their torpedo often in a circuitous route. <laughs> um, that puts it in a counterintuitive position. Meanwhile, the U-boat isn't just standing there, it's taking evasive actions and trying to um, jam the signal from the, from the, uh, from the, the warship. Okay. So, um, so, now, the U-boat had a lot of things it could do, it was an active participant in this, in this struggle. Um, if it could detect, you know, decode the communications between the two, the torpedo and the ship, it would know where the torpedo is and could arrange to be somewhere else. Because the torpedo is just sort of not going on the direct route, it doesn't quite know where the sub is, so the sub is perfectly capable of evading the torpedo if it knows exactly the location and direction their torpedoes have heading in. Um, also, the U-boat could just jam the signal and then the torpedo wanders off aimlessly and blows up some coral reef somewhere. Okay, so, um, so those are two kinds of attacks that are kind of equally, uh, equally thwarting to the Allied plans. Did you put it in the introduction of your paper or just for the talk purposes, this story? <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> okay. But, but, okay, I probably should have, but, <laughs> okay. So the, we haven't even got to the good part of the story yet, though. Um, so, uh, you know, the Allies needed some new idea, and uh, became a, the, the idea came from kind of an unlikely source. Um, Hedy Lamar was, um, uh, started her career, she was born in Austria to at least uh, a half German, a half Jewish um, household, and she started her career in some kind of semi-pornographic German film um, before she was discovered by Hollywood and brought to Hollywood, um, and she was declared the most beautiful woman in the world um, by the 
person who owned her contract. <laughs> it was, of course, totally ob objective about these things. So, um, so, but she had, she, you know, you can imagine that she had a big grudge against the Nazis um, who not only uh, were out to get her family, but probably had arrested by this point everybody that, was, that she was involved with for making degenerate films. Um, so um, she was also, you know, as a, I, I don't know how to get rid of this. Click on the X. Click on the X. Um. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so the, the, you know, the stereotypes were pretty bad at the time. Because she was beautiful, um, most of the, the Hollywood producers thought she was stupid. And so they gave her very undemanding roles where she just had to sit around looking glamorous and gave her very little to think about <laughs> during the movie shoots. So she decided to use all those spare un unused cycles in her mind <laughs> to invent things um, and became, um, a and bef um, there was a, a new kind of, before, before she turned to winning the World War II, um, she invented things like a, a different kind of traffic stop. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay. Now, she had the idea that um, in order to resist this kind of jamming and eavesdropping, instead of broadcasting on one frequency, the, um, the uh, ally, allied ship should skip around from frequency to frequency in rapid succession, uh, evading the um, German capacity to block the transmission or to eavesdrop on it. Okay. Um, but how to implement this? So um, she turned for assistance in this kind of technical details to um, a friend of hers who was kind of equally unlikely as an inventor. Um, his name's George Antheo, and he was known as the bad boy of music. Uh, that's the name of his autobiogra autobiography, so <laughs> um, it's at least somewhat authentic. He looks like the bad boy. Um, and he was an avant-garde composer, often worked in the film industry, so I think that's where Hedy uh, knew him from. And um, he, his work involved uh, uh, having kind of programmable instruments, like based on player pianos, that um, could be programmed to play the strange kind of chaotic music that he enjoyed. Um, so, um, so, but you know, if you can produce what is a, a note but a frequency. So if you can produce a sequence of notes rapidly and chaotically, can't use the same technology to change frequency in your broadcast rapidly and um, chaotically. So they used, um, adapted a player piano as the device that they were going to use to shift the frequencies sync, um, you know, both at the, at the same time um, from the ship's transmitter and inside the torpedo. Okay. Um, this is not, this is a player piano. It is not one of their player pianos. Um, I couldn't find a picture of their piano. Okay. So, um, okay. So, um, so unfortunately, um, this idea seemed to be ahead of its time. It wasn't actually adopted by the Navy in order to, in, in time to win World War II. They had to do, they had to, to slug it out by other means. Um, it, but it was eventually adopted by the Navy, coincidentally after two things had occurred. The transistor had been invented, so you didn't need player pianos. You could actually have electronics to do the frequency shifting, and their patent had expired. And which factor was the more important for the timing is a matter of, of opinion. Okay, so, um, but 
this idea of um, sending a message of, along multiple frequencies uh, is the core of an of a area of that's become central to communications called spe spread spectrum techniques and is now uh, vital to cell phone and wireless, the cell phone and wireless communications. Okay. Not necessarily for security reasons, but because it, it sends a signal more reliably um, with low power usage. And they can be pooled more, a bunch of signals can be pooled. Um, okay, so, um, so I became sort of aware that this area of spread spectrum existed when I was involved. So like many years passed, and um, I got, for some reason, involved in this DARPA grant project to build a, um, a chaotic radio, which is not much more sophisticated than a chaotic player piano, as far as I can tell. But we, we weren't quite sure what a chaotic radio was supposed to be or what it was supposed to do. And um, anyway, so we had some conjectures. And my, my co-PI um, had this sort of policy um, that of um, first you publicize the work in the press, then you get the grant, and then you do the work. <laughs> um, so this is this is like the um, this is the the text of the like the one of like two popular science articles that I'm quoted in um, talking about things I didn't understand at all. So was it <laughs> after the between the A after the A Henry, Henry so Ar Arbabino? No, it's a Barbino. Sorry, there is no R. There is no R. Did I misspell his name? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So, whatever you write, you say about him, at least. Uh, at least that's not libelous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you Names have been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Russell did intentionally put this thing that it blocks your name. It blocks your name. I assume your name is uh, the kinds of black thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Well, yeah. That's that's totally intentional. It's been classified. <laughs> but you know. Speaking of classified, so I went to the kickoff meeting, and we had gotten like our proposal approved by, it was like a, a big proposal, and it had been approved by all the way up. And so at the kickoff meeting, I talked to like the general who's the head of DARPA, or you know, close to the head of DARPA, as close as I'm going to get, um, and asked him, you know, so now that we have our grant, can you tell us what you want this radio to do? <laughs> And he said, no. I said, well, I understand the need for secrecy, but can't you just give us a hint? <laughs> he said, no, you don't understand. I'm not authorized to know. <laughs> so I can't tell you at all. <laughs> anyway, so I had this, you know, was supposed to do something on this grant. And, OK. But after, you know, so the, after like the, the generals left the kickoff meeting and the majors left and the professors left, someone introduced themselves as like Corporal so-and-so <laughs> and who actually knew what he was talking about <laughs> and he realized that I didn't. <laughs> so he told me, you know, all these things you've been saying, this, there's a whole area dedicated to them called spread spectrum security, which is the first time I had ever heard those words. Oh, I had heard security before. <laughs> but so, um, so, so I borrowed a very, a very thick book on the subject and started reading it. And it became very clear that, um, <laughs> that either I'd have to like, spend a lot of time learning about how <laughs> you know, this spread spread spectrum stuff works and, and going back and doing calculus and things like that. Um, or I could just make it up myself. And so this is like in the late 90s. And so I decided, of course, to try to like 
make it up myself. <laughs> and try to come up with something where you didn't, it was kind of so general, you didn't need to understand the details of radio. Which are, which are very complicated, right? Because, you know, you're doing a, a radio, it matters what the weather is. Okay? So how do you model a channel where it matters what the weather is? Okay. So, um, so let's go back to the, <laughs> you know, so this radio and the torpedoes are, are pretty much the same. So, um, so let's go back to the, the origins. Um, so um, here, remember that there are two threats. The submarine could jam the sea frequency, or it could eavesdrop on where the torpedo is. Okay. So, um, so let's see. You know, let's look at some of the features of a model that would have to that would have to like talk about this kind of uh, situation. Um, so we have to like say, okay, so, you know, in some sense it's pretty standard, <coughs> the standard Alice, Bob, Eve situation. Alice is the, on the ship trying to guide the torpedo. Bob is the torpedo, okay, um, trying to figure out what Alice is saying. Um, and uh, the eavesdropper is the submarine, is on the submarine. Okay, and um, so the... The eavesdropper can win in two ways. It can block the signal from getting through, or it, the eavesdropper can figure out what the signal is. Okay. So um, the communication channel is very complex, so we don't want to have any, any sort of like uh, moving target, very literally. Um, we don't really want to have a detailed model of exactly what this channel is or make uh, you know, we want to just say it has some properties. Okay, uh, and um, we don't know. We're hoping that our signal can't be totally jammed or totally uh, eavesdropped, but we don't know why it can't. Okay, you know, maybe what we found is that sometimes our, our torpedo hits the submarine, so we know it sometimes works. Okay, but we don't know, you know, the reason why it works might be a whole bunch of, of limitations. The submarine might not have the total amount of information available to it, so it doesn't, you know, know where the, the ship is exactly, where the torpedo is exactly. Okay. So it might have some information theoretic limitations. You know, we're, say we're using the um, uh, Hedy Lamar solution and, and sending the signals on a pseudo-random sequence of frequencies it might be a part of the limitation might be the computational complexity of, of predicting the pseudorandom sequence. Um, um, and part of the reason might be totally for a different reason. You know, it can't completely jam the signal because that would take too much power. Okay. So um, okay. So we want to model to deal with this kind of situation that, in some sense, has a, I think has the following properties. Okay. It's agnostic in that it doesn't really distinguish between whether the limitations are information theoretic or complexity theoretic or other. Okay. Um, it's functional rather than, um, so a lot of information theoretic cryptography is great, but assumes that you know exactly what's going on, okay? That the channel is sort of known to you. We don't want to assume that we know what the channel is. We just want to assume that we know what the parties can do. So we want to make sure that all the, all the, everything we need to know about the channel is captured in a few axioms that say what the parties can do rather than what type of object the channel is, okay? Um, we need to consider reliability and secrecy together. We can't just consider one at a time. And it's going to maybe, um, it's going to turn out that if you don't, if you try to consider them one at a time, pretty much standard methods work, but you really can't do that. If you increase reliability, you blow secrecy in completely and vice versa. Okay, so if you just do them separately, 
is not going to give you anything interesting. Okay, and we want um, things in this model to be composable. So if we build one kind of channel from another, and then a third from the second, we'd like to say we can we can um, build the third from the first. Now this is a weaker notion of composability than say like universal composability. We're not trying to say in all situations any kind of interleaving of the protocols is, is going to work. Just that the basic thing that you'd want to do is sufficiently modular that it actually applies. Why any reason not to choose for universal composability? Just because it's difficult. But, but it would be a great ideal um, maybe that's a pun to shoot for, but it's sort of beyond what we what what we're we're able to do right now. Um, okay, so um, so you know another goal besides like you know justifying my presence on this grant from thirty years ago, twenty years ago, um, is uh, is we've got a lot of great complexity theoretic cryptography and a lot of great information theoretic cryptography, but they don't quite go together right now. Um, and so we'd like a model that would allow us to use information theoretic techniques in a cryptographic setting and cryptographic techniques in an information theoretic setting. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so now I have to actually like start Talking about what what we're at, what we actually do. Um, so, uh, how much time do I have? Do I have any? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Eight minutes. Okay, I'll try to get. This. Okay. So, we got. So we're saying that there's. We're not assuming that the channel. The channel is a moving target, right? Jellyfish comes by, changes everything. So the channel has a set of states that's not memoryless. And the states determine exactly what happens when, when you try to send a message. Also, the, the eavesdropper isn't passive. It's doing the jamming. Okay? So there's a set of attacks that the eavesdropper can make. Um, the state changes, and you get um, a new state and but the person receives a bit. So you, the function, the transition function gets the bit Alice is trying to send, um, the tack that Eve is making, and the current state, and gets a new state in the bit that Bob receives. Okay. Eve gets some information based on the new state, um, and um, it's going to turn out we're going to have to basically uh, drop this, but is in the original most most general model, it's just some arbitrary function of the state and gives you a string that you can do some computation on. And we're not assuming that Eve has has all co all powerful computation, or that it's limited to polynomial time. We just say there's some set of functions Eve can can compute. Okay, and that determines what. In particular, in this setting, uh, what, how she can guess what the bit being sent is. Okay. So, um, so now, uh, as I said, there's a, a subclass of of um, channels that turns out to be pretty important for us uh, called transparent channels. And transparent channels means that Eve sees the is transparent in that Eve sees the entire state and knows how the transition function works. So um, in cryptographic settings, a protocol with no secret keys, it will be a transparent channel. But a protocol where any party has a secret key uh, will, in general, be a, 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 a non-transparent channel. But an ad hoc key, you do secret key exchange. If you, if you, if this, yeah. So that's that's going to be transparent. But if you get pick the secret key and it, and keep it, that will be non-transparent. OK, and now I have five minutes. OK, so, um, so this is even this, I know it's a little bit hard to digest all those ingredients, but this is even like a simplified model. Um, 
if you because we're only looking at data transmission uh, trying to send data reliably uh, and secretly uh, and you can assume that the data is flowing from Alice to Bob okay so um, that's simple and that Al so Alice and Bob are trusted so that simplifies a lot of things other issues we'd have to actually put in more ingredients okay um, so um, but for this purpose, this is without loss of gener a lot of these things are without loss of generality. Um, okay, so um, when we want to say we want to design a protocol, we want to take one channel with some guarantees to another channel with stronger guarantees um, or different guarantees. Um, but we can invo evoke the channel in the protocol, but we can't know what it is. The protocol can't do anything except use the channel as a black box. And so it should work for any channel. The same protocol should work for any channel with those properties. Uh, OK, so that's what I mean by agnostic. Uh, so what, what properties are we looking at mainly here is like the secrecy and reliability amplification. So we say that channel is alpha secret if the probability that Eve can guess the bit being sent is at most 1 minus alpha. Okay. And it's beta reliable. It probably should be called beta unreliable. If, the pro if um, whatever the eavesdropper does, whatever attack the eavesdropper does, Bob does get the bit with probability one, at least 1 minus beta. That's not an equal beta. That should be a minus. OK. So um, here are our results. First, um, this is what we want to, and what we want to do is take a channel with just small alphas and betas and make them, you know, make beta, or a small alpha and a big beta and make beta really small so the channel is very reliable and alpha very close to a half so that the channel is pseudo random. Okay? So, um, so, but even for a perfectly reliable channel, if in general, this is impossible. There's no way of taking a general non-transparent channel and, uh, and doing this hard, uh, secure secrecy amplification without totally ruining reliability. Um, so, um, so we, but for transparent channels, you can do something, at least some of the time. If alpha is bigger than three times beta, there's a one-way protocol where Alice just communicates with to Bob and not vice versa that takes an alpha secret beta reliable channel. So Eve is, has a failure probability about three times what Bob has. And we can make that into Eve not knowing anything about the secret and Bob always getting the secret, except with exponentially small probability. Okay. Um, now, we worked for many years trying to improve this to be like just alpha bigger than beta. And just recently, uh, it was pointed out to us, even pointed out to us for the, the like fifth time, um, but we finally understood it, <laughs> that there was this paper by Holenstein and Renner, which implies that um, if alpha is less than two beta, essentially, no one-way protocol can possibly uh, help at all. OK? Uh, so um, but what we do manage to do is break this barrier using a two-way protocol where Bob gets to talk back. Okay? So um, if we still need alpha to be bigger than a constant times beta, but instead of the constant being 2, where the lower bound holds, the constant can be 1.5. And so um, that shows that two-way protocols can, are provably better than one-way protocols in this context. Weiner wider type capital is one very special case. That is an example where you know what the channel is. Yeah. Um, and so that was like generalized by Maurer and, uh, and then his students like, like, like Thomas Holenstein. So a lot is known about that model. Um, here, okay, things work a little bit differently. So um, because, we're ta because we need to have because we don't know the adversary has some adaptive power, things that work in their model, in the Weiner model, don't necessarily work in our model. 
So let me give an example of where there are some subtleties in the model. So here, you know, we, we just composed very simple protocols. Like you send uh, k bits through the channel, send r bits through the channel. In the clear, in the clear means you send them enough times through the channel that everybody knows what they are very, with very high probability. Um, and then you take the inner product mod 2. Okay? So that's a very standard type of protocol. And we can prove that that it, it damages re reliability, makes it exponentially close to a half, but it, damage, it improves secrecy bet more if, in a certain range of parameters. Okay? So, um, so uh, yeah, OK. But if you send the k bits first, and then send the bits through the channel, this protocol is totally broken and is completely unreliable. Okay. Uh, so because Eve has the power to stop blocking the messages. Okay. And I'm out of time, but um, okay. There are some results that might be interesting even in the standard cryptographic setting, uh, like um, how to create, uh, do this for a secret key agreement. Okay. And we'd like to generalize this to other settings that are more complex. Is it available? Uh, available by request. Hopefully it'll be, okay, we, it's in submission right now. I guess you're not on the program committee. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll make it available. <laughs>